Two great mysteries dominate our lives, love and money. What is love is a question that has been endlessly explored in stories, songs, books, movies, and television. But the same cannot be said about the question, what is money? It's not surprising that monetary theory hasn't inspired any blockbuster movies, but it was not even mentioned at the schools most of us attended. For most of us, the question, where does money come from, brings to mind a picture of the mint printing bills and stamping coins. Money, most of us believe, is created by the government. It's true, but only to a point. Those metal and paper symbols of value we usually think of as money are indeed produced by an agency of the federal government called the Mint. But the vast majority of money is not created by the Mint. It is created in huge amounts every day by private corporations known as banks. Most of us believe that banks lend out money that has been entrusted to them by depositors. Easy to picture, but not the truth. In fact, banks create the money they loan, not from the bank's own earnings, not from the money deposited, but directly from the borrower's promise to repay. The borrower's signature on the loan papers is an obligation to pay the bank the amount of the loan plus interest, or lose the house, the car, whatever asset was pledged as collateral. That's a big commitment from the borrower. What does the same signature require of the bank? The bank gets to conjure into existence the amount of the loan and just write it into the borrower's account. Sound far-fetched? Surely that can't be true. But it is. Over the years, the fractional reserve system and its integrated network of banks backed by a central bank has become the dominant money system of the world. At the same time, the fraction of gold backing the debt money has steadily shrunk to nothing. The basic nature of money has changed. In the past, a paper dollar was actually a receipt that could be redeemed for a fixed weight of gold or silver. In the present, a paper or digital dollar can only be redeemed for another paper or digital dollar. In the past, privately created bank credit existed only in the form of private banknotes, which people had the choice to refuse, just as we have the choice to refuse someone's private check today. In the present, privately created bank credit is legally convertible to government-issued fiat currency, the dollars, loonies, and pounds we habitually think of as money. Fiat currency is money created by government fiat, or decree, and legal tender laws declare that citizens must accept this fiat money as payment for debt or else the courts will not enforce the obligation. So now the question is, if governments and banks can both just create money, then how much money exists? In the past, the total amount of money in existence was limited to the actual physical quantities of whatever commodity was in use as money. For example, in order for new gold or silver money to be created, more gold or silver had to be found and dug out of the ground. In the present, money is literally created as debt. New money is created whenever anyone takes a loan from the bank. As a result, the total amount of money that can be created has only one real limit, the total level of debt. Governments place an additional statutory limit on the creation of new money by enforcing rules known as fractional reserve requirements. Essentially arbitrary, fractional reserve requirements vary from country to country and from time to time. In the past, it was common to require banks to have at least $1 worth of real gold in the vault to back $10 worth of debt money created. Today, reserve requirement ratios no longer apply to the ratio of new money to gold on deposit, but merely to the ratio of new debt money to existing debt money on deposit in the bank. 
Today, a bank's reserves consist of two things. The amount of government-issued cash, or equivalent, that the bank has deposited with the central bank, plus the amount of already existing debt money the bank has on deposit. To illustrate this in a simple way, Let's imagine that a new bank has just started up and has no depositors yet. However, the bank's investors have made a reserve deposit of $1,111.12 of existing cash money at the central bank. The required reserve ratio is 9 to 1. Step 1. The doors open and the new bank welcomes its first loan customer. He needs $10,000 to buy a car. At the 9 to 1 reserve ratio, the new bank's reserve at the central bank, also known as high-powered money, allows it to legally conjure into existence nine times that amount, or $10,000, on the basis of the borrower's pledge of debt. This $10,000 is not taken from anywhere. It's brand new money simply typed into the borrower's account as bank credit. The borrower then writes a check on that bank credit to buy the used car. Step 2. The seller then deposits this newly created $10,000 at her bank. Unlike the high-powered government money deposited at the central bank, this newly created credit money cannot be multiplied by the reserve ratio. Instead, it's divided by the reserve ratio. At a ratio of 9 to 1, a new loan of $9,000 can be created on the basis of the $10,000 deposit. Step 3. If that $9,000 is then deposited by a third party at the same bank that created it or at a different one, it becomes the legal basis for a third issue of bank credit, this time for the amount of $8,100. Like one of those Russian dolls where each layer contains a slightly smaller doll inside, each new deposit contains the potential for a slightly smaller loan in an infinitely decreasing series. Now, if the loan money created is not deposited at the bank, the process stops. That's the unpredictable part of the money creation mechanism. But more likely, at every step, the new money will be deposited at a bank, and the reserve ratio process can repeat itself over and over until almost $100,000 of brand new money has been created within the banking system. All of this new money has been created entirely from debt, and the whole process has been legally authorized by the initial reserve deposit of just $1,111.12, which is still sitting untouched at the central bank. What's more, under this ingenious system, the books of each bank in the chain must show that the bank has 10% more on deposit than it has out on loan. This gives banks a very real incentive to seek deposits in order to be able to make loans, supporting the general but misleading impression that loans come out of deposits. Now, unless all the successive loans are deposited at the same bank, it cannot be said that any one bank got to multiply its initial high-powered money reserve almost 90 times by issuing bank credit out of nothing. However, the banking system is a closed loop. Bank credit created at one bank becomes a deposit in another, and vice versa. In a theoretical world of perfectly equal exchanges, the ultimate effect would be exactly the same as if the whole process took place within one bank. That is, the bank's initial central bank reserve of a little over $1,100 allows it to ultimately collect interest on up to $100,000 the bank never had. surveyed scores of non-economists, both highly educated professionals and common sense people on the street, and found that not one of them had an accurate understanding of how money is created. In fact, it's probably safe to say that most people, including the frontline employees of banks, have never given the matter a moment's thought. Have you?